Welcome to another life-impacting message from City Light Church. You can find more great content like this online at citylight.church. We are, here we are, Romans 8. We are, men. I'm so excited. We are just getting into Not that the first half of Romans 8 has not been amazing. First half of Romans 8 is phenomenal. Every paragraph, building on the foundation of the paragraph that's gone before, laying this amazing foundation. And the foundation really is both amazing in its own right and helps us to get to where we are today and where we are over the next couple of weeks. Some of the most famous words in the Bible over the next month. So even if we have to not congregate like this over the next month, we absolutely will still be like live streaming. So you can still set aside an hour and 15 minutes, uh, maybe gather with your home group or gather by yourself um, and virtually gather with everybody else as we will still continue to go through um, this series, this chapter, because again, we're, we're just getting to this most amazing, like all that has come before has been, again, amazing in its own right, but uh, in light of what is to come. It's like this foundation has been built and now we're getting what is uh, the, the thing, the object that uh, we actually want to see that it's built upon. So this week we're in Romans 8, 24 to 27. I'm going to read it, I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll see what God would have for us today. This is Romans 8, 24. Now, In this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for these words. Thank you for Paul who wrote them down. We are so thankful for your Holy Spirit who has inspired this entire letter and this entire book filled with uh, writings for our good, for our building up, for our correction, so that we know your mind, so that we would know your plan, would know your character, so we'd know who we are, in you and we would know what it is that you have done for us and want for us and from us. And so help us tonight to be in step with the Spirit. Help us to um, hear you as you speak through these scriptures. And again, by your Spirit, we, we really do. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to think more like him, love more like him. And so shape us by your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Alrighty, so again, he's built on this foundation, this logical progression, and he starts this passage saying, now. So all that's come before, he's like, and now. Now we're getting to the meat of it. Now we're going to get, we're like, now is the, is the key. In this hope, we were saved. In what hope? We're going to go back just a couple of verses from last week. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now, Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves eagerly. Again, there's that word, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So in in what hope are we saved? What is this hope that he's talking about? He says, now, in this hope... We were saved. It's in, it's in the hope that he's just talked about, the resurrection of our bodies. They're actually eagerly waiting for this. We are gro- like All of creation has been groaning under the weight of sin, wondering when will we be relieved from this. And those that belong to, to God, we groan in our spirit as well, saying, Lord, how long will you wait how much longer do we need to go through the, the pain and suffer the effects of sin? We are, we are waiting, we are groaning for, we're eagerly expecting the resurrection to come. And he says, in this hope, we were saved. We're not saved by our hope. It's not like the, the amount of hope you have saves you. That's not what he's saying here. You're not saved by your hope. But hope is the condition of all who are saved. Everyone who's saved hopes. Everyone who's saved hopes. And it's not a, it's not like a, well, I mean, I hope I win the lottery or I hope he likes me. 
or I hope to get that house, or these kinds of hopes, the hope that he's talking about is a sure hope. He talks about this hope in another place when he's writing to the church in Ephesus. Uh, in Ephesians 1, 17, he says, I pray, this is his prayer for these people, I pray that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's praying, he says that, that God would give you the spirit so that you would know something. Someone would be revealed to you and that you would know it. And what is it? He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So, you know, your heart, the, your, your innermost kind of, center of who you are would be enlightened, brought into light so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Paul is praying for his people. And this is, I mean, this is my and the elders and the leaders and your discipleship leaders prayer for you as well, is that you would know the hope of Jesus calling you, Jesus coming for you, doing the work that we couldn't do, paying the debt that we owed, Re resurrecting as a, the, like the first fruits, giving us his Holy Spirit as a deposit that we too might participate in his resurrection and that he would call us into this same life. Man, we have this great hope. <clears throat> and he goes on. What does hope bring with it? What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? We looked at this last week. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? according to the mighty work of his strength, not according to our perception, not according to our the limits of what we expect from him, but according to the mighty working of his own strength. And then he goes on, verse 20, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead. So Paul wants his people to know, and, and the Spirit wants us to know, to be revealed in us, that we would walk in the light of the knowledge of Jesus calling us. And we have this great power in the Holy Spirit living in us. What power? The power was exercised in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens. It's the resurrection power. That's what the power is. What is the hope? It's the, re it's the hope of the resurrection. It's the hope that what we see, what we touch, what we can control is not all that there is. In fact, the things that we even can't control is not all that there is. We're not, not only are we not bound by just what we can see, but we are, we're not constrained to hope only in what we can see. We're not constrained to hope only in what we can touch and feel. We hope in something that's far, far greater. And we eagerly wait for it with patience. The resurrection of our bodies and the restoration of all things. That's what he talks about next. He says, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Man, that's a phenomenal hope that we have. That Jesus would do this, yes, for his glory and primarily for his glory, but also what Paul says is for his church, for all of us who belong to him. He's done these things. So we have this great, great guarantee. It's not just a, again, it's not a wishy-washy, vague kind of wish. It's a, it's a sure hope. We anchor our hope in something that's not in this world. Therefore, nothing in the world can take away our hope. It is an amazing, amazing promise. Now, Paul knows we don't always like, live in the reality of this hope. He goes on. Uh, he explicitly says, Hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. We're living through a time, maybe even right now, maybe in your lifetime, this is a unique time, where we're living through fairly uncertain times. <clears throat> for the last 10 years, the, the global economy, apart from like certain points, has been on this mad upward trajectory and all of a sudden kabam mammoth crash and possible like global recession coming speaking to somebody yesterday and he said oh man i looked at my superannuation he said i oh, just like what am i gonna do i'm like dude you are you're 40 you got like years left uh and and not only that but you know the way that the market goes this will be a blip and yet we don't know that 
uncertain times. Beginning of this year, Australia was like blanketed in flames. People losing their homes and, and air quality terrible. Uh, so, you know, ec- economically, um, the things that we may be building our hope upon seem pretty shaky at the moment. Um, even physically now, we have this global pandemic going around. And again, for most people at this gathering, probably not too worried about it personally. Uh, although you might be worried about it if loved ones, people in your family and your friends, certainly there are, like I said before, the people in this church community who are very susceptible and vulnerable uh, to this virus going around. And so people, people's even physical hope in their own physicality is maybe on that shaky ground, economic shaky ground. And we're being told to socially isolate or socially distance, I should say. But we're already a socially isolated community or culture. And so a socially isolated culture being told to socially distance just puts another thing that was already, another foundation that was already shaky, uh, makes it even more shaky. We in Australia in 2020 live in still, even, in, even with all these things, we still live in one of the most comfortable, prosperous, safe, healthy um, nations that has ever existed. And what we, even in the church, have tended to do is build our hope. We have this hope, like a vague hope in Jesus. But we don't really need that hope because we have hope in stuff that we can see and feel and and even to a certain extent control. For want better health, I can eat better. Uh, I can go to a, um, a physio or, or a chiro or a naturopath or a PT um, or a GP. I can take supplements. I can exercise. If I want more control of my finances, I might save or invest or get a financial advisor or you know, try to earn more, earn more money or things like this. We, we put a hope in our comfort and all of a sudden, all of these, just one by one, I, I put it to you, the idols of Australia in 2020, are kind of, they're not being destroyed, but they're being questioned. I was walking around the shops yesterday, keeping my 1.5 metre distance from everybody, and yet close enough to be able to overhear conversations, not creepily, mind you, just as you walk around, every single conversation about coronavirus. And these are, some people obviously knew each other, some people just wanted to talk about it. They're concerned. It's top of mind. I look through my newsfeed, every single, I mean every single post, uh, every single news article, corona, 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 corona. What does it mean for the environment? What does it mean for society? What does it mean for culture? What does it mean for schools? What does it mean for hospitals? What does it mean for aged care um, homes? What does it mean for Australia? What does it mean for America? What does it mean for Italy? What does it mean for Europe? So today, again, the PM just made this new uh, regulation that people flying in from Overseas, mandatory 14-day, uh, I mean, self re- self-regulated um, isolation. It's uh, it is kind of all-encompassing at the moment, and so we live on this shaky ground. And my hope is that w- this would be a great challenge to all of us, that we would see this and not freak out, but say, "Ah, oh, yes, these things are not worthy of my hope." These things are not worthy of anchoring my joy. So that if I lose my health, my hope doesn't fade. It doesn't go away. If I lose all my money, my hope doesn't go away. If I lose maybe a relationship due to social isolating or whatever, my hope doesn't go away. Does this make any sense? If I lose my house to fire, my hope doesn't go away. We're not putting our hope in these things. We're not putting our hope in the world such that the world can take away our hope. We're putting our hope, anchoring it in the person and work of Jesus and in the resurrection to come, that even if we lose our life, we don't lose our hope. This is what he's trying to say. If you hope in something that you see, it's not really hope. G.K. Chesterton, he said it like this, hope means hoping when things are hopeless or it's no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, Hope is merely flattery or platitude. It's only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. So you don't actually know what your, where your hope lies or how strong your hope is in Jesus or the fullness of the, the beauty of having your hope solely in Jesus until all of these other foundations that you've placed your hope in the world uh, have been taken away from you. Only when Jesus is all that you have, 
is that when you realize Jesus is all that you need. That's what Chesterton is saying. When hope fades in those things which you've stored, once stored hope, true hope in Jesus can become that true hope. It's, it's, this, is, this is really a refining and defining time for the church in Australia and across the world. But we're in Australia, so let's talk about Australia. This is a time for us to take stock, critique the foundations we've built up, the control that we like to have over things. I'm not saying don't enjoy good health. I'm not saying don't enjoy good relationships. I'm not saying don't invest in all of these things. Like do all of those things, but do it in a way in which you're not anchoring your hope in those things, but so that you can take, uh, you can go to those things not expecting hope from any of them. Actually frees you again really radically to be able to have joy in these, have joy in spite of those things and enjoy those things, not wanting to derive something from them that they cannot possibly give you. So we eagerly wait for it with patience, he says. We have this hope, the resurrection, even if we die, yet we live. So we eagerly wait for it with patience. I don't know if you've really thought about that sentence before or that part of the sentence. How do you eagerly wait for something with patience? If you're eager for something, usually it means you're impatient, right? It means, man, I just cannot wait for this thing. I cannot wait. Uh, I've got a five-year-old. His name's Harvey, just a legendary little dude. And I reckon from about two months after his birthday, every week to 10 days, he asks, is it my birthday next week? Is it my birthday soon? He is eagerly anticipating his birthday because he knows birthdays are joy-filled and presents and we normally don't have a lot of sugar in our house, but man, we go for it on birthdays. Not much patience, but lots of eagerness. Usually if we're patient, it means we're not altogether that eager. Although you need to be, you need to have a little bit of eagerness in order to actually have to exercise patience. This is what John Stott says about this. He says, the combination of eagerness and patience is really significant. We are to wait neither so eagerly that we lose our patience, nor so patiently that we lose our expectation, but eagerly and patiently together. Yet it is hard to keep this balance. Some Christians overemphasize the call to patience. They lack enthusiasm and lapse into lethargy, apathy, and pessimism. They've forgotten God's promises and are guilty of unbelief. Others grow impatient of waiting. They're so carried away with enthusiasm, they almost try to force God's hand. They're determined to experience now even what is not available yet. Understandably anxious to emerge out of the painful present of suffering and groaning. They talk as if the resurrection had already taken place and the body should no longer be subject to weakness, disease, pain and decay. Yet, such impatience is a form of presumption. I mean, I have, I mean, going even just in this time now of, you know, corona, I would say panic, uh, where we've been told don't congregate in non-essential gatherings over 500 people. I fully anticipate that number will, will diminish over the next few days to weeks, 250, maybe even 100 people. And yet <clears throat> I know uh, of people who are organizing for like trips overseas or gatherings locally who are saying things like, well, no, we'll just, we'll just pray harder and then no one will get sick. And I'm like, oh man, that's... I don't think you really kind of understand what's going on. This is the presumption that some people who have this like over-realized eschatology, if you like, as if the resurrection has already happened and as if those promises are present promises. No, no, they're promises that we have hope for in the future. It is to rebel against the God of history. Stock goes on. Who has indeed acted conclusively for our salvation and who will most assuredly complete when Christ comes what he has begun, but who refuses to be hustled into changing his plan timetable just because we do not enjoy having to go on waiting and groaning. God, give us a patient eagerness and an eager patience as we wait for his promises to be fulfilled. This is really important for us. We do want to be like on the edge of our seats. This is the, this I believe is the natural disposition of the Christian who is excited about the things to come. Who, who would pray like Lord Jesus come. Bring this age to fruition and let's get into the new earth. Let's, let's do this. Oh, we just seen in Romans 8 a few weeks ago, oh man, we, we groan along with creation. How long? Pain, 
sucks. All different kinds of pain uh, really hurt. And one day we know we're living in the promise of the fact that this hope that Jesus is going to come, wipe away every tear, all things made new, all things restored. Uh, we get to be with him forever. It's awesome. Resurrected bodies. I can't wait. We, we, we are to eagerly anticipate this. And yet we're also to be patient. We know the Spirit's doing a work in us. We know the Spirit's doing a work through us. We know because we have responded to Jesus' call, uh, that we, it, just like our response to the coronavirus isn't, well, I'm under 40 and generally healthy, so uh, you know, I'll just go do whatever I want to do. Uh, no, 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 we're not here for ourselves. We're to prefer the need of the other. And just like Jesus called us, he's also calling many other sons and daughters. And this is, this is why we're patient, because we hope for it, but it may be still yeah, a long way to go. Paul goes on, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In the same way as what? In the same way as when creation groans and when we groan, the Spirit also groans with us. When we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit comes alongside us and says, yes, God is your Father. And when we, when we cry out to God and say, God, this sucks, the Spirit cries and groans along with us. This sucks. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in that our hope leads to perseverance and patience and an eager expectation in the face of trials. And also in the same way, the Spirit helps us in the face of trials. It's the same way in that we don't hope for the things in the material world. That's not where our hope belongs. And also, Paul says here, even when we don't know what to ask God for, the Spirit himself comes and helps us immaterially. This is what he, this is what he talks about. He says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. We need to acknowledge that we're weak. Again, we try to build up foundations for us that we can control, <clears throat> that we can be happy with. Uh, instead, Paul here is really showing us, no, 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 you're weak, but that's okay because you have the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit helps us in our weakness because we don't know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Do you ever find yourself not knowing what to pray for or what to pray? I find myself not knowing what to pray often, at least weekly, uh, often, often more than that, many times in the last week. I've, I've, if you like, come before God and go, man, I, I know I need to be, I know, man, there's so many concerns, so many things going on, uh, so many needs for my, na- for my neighbours and people in the church, uh, so much praise to be given, just don't have the words right now. And, and not only that, but even uh, he's saying we don't know what to pray for, so as we should. So sometimes we pray for things like incorrectly or things maybe we shouldn't pray for or, or we, pray, we pray wrongly. And what does he say? The Spirit helps us. God already knows what you need. He already knows what you want. He actually knows you far, far better than you, you even know yourself. When we see the world isn't as it should be, all the things we looked at last week, and again, creation is itself groaning when will it end. The Spirit intercedes on our behalf. This is what it means for us. It means when we pray, even when we don't know what to pray, or even when we pray but not as we should or not what we should, the Spirit intercedes, meaning He stands in between us and the Father. And He takes our prayers and He communicates them to the Father in a way in which we should have said them. This is actually one of the most beautiful promises in all Scripture. When we don't pray properly, when we don't pray as we should, when we don't pray what we should, when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit helps us in that He takes our feeble, weak prayers and He takes them to the Father and translates them, if you like, into what we should have prayed if we knew uh, what we should ask for. It's wonderful. It means that there's never a time to not pray. Means we can always pray. Means we can pray when we don't feel like it, when we don't know what to say. Or even if you're worried about saying the right or wrong things, uh, let me tell you, uh, I mean, maybe public prayer is different because uh, if you're in a position of leadership, you don't want to pray things that might mislead people in, in a, like a, 
pedagogical kind of way or a teaching kind of way. But when you're praying just yourself or in you know, a small group or home group or whatever, uh, what Paul is encouraging us to do here is to just pray. Like, go for it. God loves you. He relates to you as Father. He's given you his Holy Spirit so that you can always ask the right thing. There's no magic words you need to say. Prayer is not a spell or a formula. Prayer is communicating with God and the Spirit takes what we did say and turns it into what we should have said. And God loves to answer prayers. And so he wants to answer the prayers according to his will. And so our prayers, when they hit his figurative ears, are the right prayers that he wants to answer. Man, if we understand this, we would pray really bold prayers. This is what the Spurge says. If your heart is cold, do not wait until your heart warms. Pray your soul into heat with the help of the ever-blessed Holy Spirit who helps in our weakness, who makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. I've heard it, I've heard it said like this. It's kind of like it, it's the Spirit's participation. Uh, he, he's interceding for us. It's not like we can just go, well, we won't pray and the Spirit will just do it for us. No, no, no. Spirit is interceding for us. He is standing in the middle for us. But it's kind of like we pick up a log, we just can't move. Can't pick up the log. It's too long for us to do anything with. And the Spirit comes up and picks up the other end. We actually, we can't do it by ourselves. He helps us in our weakness. Do the, th the very thing that we are hoping to do. If, uh, the, what he's not saying here is he's not talking about when it says inexpressible groanings. He's not talking about us having inexpressible groanings. He's talking about the Spirit having, like not communicating in words, not bound by our language. He takes what we say in our feeble, weak words and ways and communicates them without words to the Father in the perfect way. He's not talking about like speaking in tongues or any of that kind of stuff here. That's not what this is about. He's talking about the Holy Spirit uh, making those prayers effectual. Uh, one place to start, if you really just don't know how to pray, uh, is to pray through Scripture. Holy Spirit inspired Scripture. Holy Spirit's helping you pray. Uh, we can be absolutely sure the Spirit will never prompt us to pray for something that's not congruent with Scripture. We can be confident He won't ever tell us anything that's not con con like congruent with what we read in Scripture. One of the ways my family likes to do this is uh, in the morning before we leave, uh, we get together, <clears throat> my, my wife and I, we will read through a psalm. We just go like chronologically through the psalms, read through a psalm, and some of the psalms are pretty messed up when you're reading with a seven, a five, and a two-year-old. Nevertheless, we'll read through the psalm, and then we'll pray through that psalm. So if the, if the psalm is a psalm of lament, we'll, we'll pray a lament. If the psalm is uh, like a joyful psalm, we'll pray joyful prayers. If the psalm is a psalm about how glorious God is, uh, we will pray, God, you are glorious, and things like this. It is very, very helpful if you're just wondering, where do I start with prayer? Uh, pray scripture. Super, it, my, my, literally, my seven-year-old can do it. He does it. Sometimes we'll, you know, we'll take in turns to pray, and sometimes Isaiah will be the one to pray, and he knows. We've just read this thing, and he'll pray. God, like, you are um, the creator of all of the universe, and we praise you for creating all of the universe. Things like this. And lastly, he finishes here. Paul finishes. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he who searches our hearts, God the Father, already knows what you need. He searches hearts. He, he knows everything about you and loves you. All the things you try to hide all the things you're successful at hiding from everybody else. He knows all those things. And he loves you. That's why he sent his son for you. He knows these things. He knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit is interceding for us, speaking to the Father with our words according to the will of the Father. Again, this is why, this is why we know. We have this great confidence that our prayers, I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you pray. Like, I, the, I put it to you, the, the more you pray, the more you will know how and what to pray for. And yet, you'll still get to places where you just like, I just don't know what to pray for. Or you'll pray incorrectly, but again, we know that the Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of the Father. And so, 
because they are one, ontologically one, different persons of the, of the Trinity, but ontologically one, one in essence. Uh, they, they communicate in ways that we don't, we don't understand, we don't know. Uh, but he always asks, the Spirit always asks of the Father perfectly what we should have asked, according to his own will. And so this is kind of how it works. The Father, by the Spirit, will prompt us to pray for something. We will pray for it, again, weakly, feebly, the Spirit will intercede for us and communicate that to the Father as if we had said it perfectly and with perfect like humility, perfect um, words and everything. And God loves to answer prayers. That's why he prompts us to pray. That's why he commands us to pray in Scripture. That's why he's made it, I would say, easy to pray in that it's not a formula. It's not a um, do this like this, and if you plug in all these things into the algorithm, you'll get the result that you want. Um, no, no, he wants, he wants you. This is what he wants. And man, I, I know we've done this the last couple of weeks, but we need to do it again. We need to kind of put a pin here and pick it up again next week because this is like the, the frame of the house is going up today and you start to see it. Uh, the foundation's been laid. The frame has gone up. You're like, oh man, this is starting to look good. But next week, we, under, we get to understand or, or we continue to grow in our understanding of what does it mean that we can operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can pray even in our weakness. What does that look like to live a lot, an overcoming life? We'll get there next week. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for these scriptures. Thank you that uh, you have pursued us with your love that we don't have to kind of flounder around trying to figure out uh, how to make you love us or trying to do uh, works to make you love us, but you have just lavishly given us your affection. We are the great beneficiaries of your love. Thank you that the Spirit intercedes for us, that he comes alongside, uh, lives in, dwells in us, and then when we pray, but not as we ought, we don't ask for the right thing or what we should ask for, or we ask weakly, feebly, that in our weakness we have this great helper who intercedes on our behalf, asks as if we had asked correctly and rightly. And Father, would you help us in our prayers? We, we do want to ask rightly. We do want to worship rightly. We do want to be really in step aligned with your Holy Spirit and we want to become more and more like Jesus. So help us, Lord. Help us to anchor our hope in the finished work of Jesus and in the resurrection to come, what that means for us. That we wouldn't build our hope into things that we can control or things that are found in the world that, that's shaky ground. Uh, help us, Lord. Um, to find our hope, our joy, holy in who we are in Christ, in your goodness, in your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to audio from City Light Church. We hope you found it helpful and we'd love for you to share this message with others. For more great content, more information about City Light Church, or to donate to the work of City Light Church, visit us online at www.citylight.church.